It's a train. It really is a train. This is absolutely awesome. This train came from somewhere and we'll talk about where. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hember. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, where we're talking about the Bible, but we're also talking about the train. And we'll do so a little bit later on. Corey is here. Corey, what's up? I'm talking about Belshazzar today, the man who is called and named as King of Babylon in the book of Daniel. All right, very good. Janice? Well, as go? many uh, of our viewers know, this is our 30th anniversary of Bible Discovery, formerly known as Quick Study. Today on our Focus on Friday, we're going to focus on some memories from the past. I look forward to that. Ryan is here. Ryan, what's up? Today I'm studying the famous prophecy of the 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9. All right, this is a good one. Get your Bible out. Let's listen to God as he begins to speak to us. Daniel 7, verses 1 through 14. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there, in this horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. We are in the book of Daniel. Now, this is amazing, I'll tell you. This book is stunning at this time. We're looking at visions that relate to our future. 
visions from the past, written about 400 BC, 450 BC that are related to our future? Absolutely. The book of Daniel is not compiled in chronological order, though. In chapter 7, Daniel was about 68 years old when he came to interpret the dream. Now, the, the year is probably about 553 BC, and the man Belshazzar, or Belshazzar was made co-regent with Nabonidus. Fourteen years later, Daniel would experience the lion's den in chapter 6. And the devil is always attempting to mess up God's work. Now, this is interesting because pay attention here. When we study the text and time carefully, we learn that Daniel was 16 years old in 605 BC when he was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this timing is important for several reasons. But one of the reasons is that I want to mention Daniel is a senior in this time and in his life at this time right now. God does not finish with us and let us retire. Now, retirement is a great time to do the work of God. God worked with many of his prophets this way, and he continues to work with us in this way, too. We don't retire, even if we can't do a lot of things we used to do. Still, we pray. And when we pray, that's different. And beloved, I need to say that uh, some of the greatest prayer warriors in my life and some of the greatest prayer warriors on our prayer team, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at three o'clock uh, on uh, YouTube and Facebook, they are seniors. I want to tell you something. They're amazing prayers. So uh, I'm just saying God is just using you and when you're ready at the end of your life, he uses you in powerful ways. So I'm just saying, not just prayer. Some people do things. Take your Bible guide, turn to today's passage. This is interesting. We've got a lot of read today. And if you don't have a Bible guide, you can write for yours or call or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, the website, and uh, you can get a hold of yours. Now, listen, thank you for your donations. Very important. And they really help us. Thank you. Father, I pray today that you would help us. We're going to study this vision. We're going to learn it. So help us, Lord, to understand what the Holy Spirit is saying. In Jesus' wonderful name, and we all said together, amen. Daniel 7, verses 1 to 4. Listen carefully. The first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. There he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, it had eagle's wings, and I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. What's Daniel seeing? See, God ordained Babylon, the first strong kingdom, to rule on the earth. Now, some people would argue with me about Egypt, but listen to me carefully. The first kingdom... Worldwide kingdom to rule on the earth. God is the ruler of man's kingdoms. Remember that. God rules man's kingdoms. So when we look at the kingdoms of man in the world today and everything else, we have to remember that God is the ruler of it. And we need to keep ourselves aligned with him. Now, some, many don't. Now let's read on. Chapter 7, verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear... It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, arise and devour much flesh. After this, I looked and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. And the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. Again, we see that God ordained, and I don't have time to go into this, the kingdoms of Persia and Greece, they rep represented here. Now, God always knows and always understands what he's doing, even if we do not. 
many people don't. But even if we do not understand, God does know what he's doing. This is very important. Now, if you want to study further on this, I encourage you to do so. But now let's go to the last, because this is very interesting. 7 to 14. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring. It was breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. Now, this is important. Listen, I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in the horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. Oh, one world leader for sure. Interesting. Verse nine, I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days, the name of God, the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame and its wheels a burning fire. A fiery steam ish stream issued and it came forth from before him. A thousand of thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him and the court was seated and the books were opened. Now I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words, which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away and their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions and behold, look at this now, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven and he came to the ancient of days. I love this. And they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, all nations, all languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. The third point here, this is really amazing. The kingdom of God is powerful and forever. In the end, we win. In the end, the kingdom of God rules. God is the Lord of everything and will judge all people everywhere. And I just have one thing to ask you. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Because he's the one at the end of your life. He's the one that you're going to have to deal with. And if you know him and if you've invited Jesus Christ into your life, then you know what's going to happen? He will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, I pray today that you would hear us, forgive us of our sin and help us, Lord, as we pray together to become you, to become Lord of our life. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. the prophet Jeremiah and the Old Testament book that's named after him, but we're going to be attempting to establish a foundation of history. Uh, and on that foundation, the idea is you will be able to better understand and interpret uh, what you read in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study, and today's reading is Daniel chapter 7 to 9. And chapter 9 is considered by many prophecy experts to be the most pivotal chapter in the entire Bible, and it's often called the backbone of Bible prophecy. And this is because most of the other prophecies in Scripture hinge on this prophecy given to Daniel. So a misunderstanding of Daniel 9 will create confusion in other places. You know, even Jesus in his famous Olivet Discourse refers back to Daniel 9 as the key to end-time prophecy. 
Let's study. In Daniel 9, we find the aged prophet seeking God for answers because he realizes from studying the prophecies of Jeremiah that the 70-year Babylonian captivity is almost over. Yet instead of God giving Daniel answers about the past, he gives him insight into the future. Indeed, beginning in verse 24, the angel Gabriel begins to give Daniel a timeline of the future that seems rather cryptic. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city, he says. The first thing to note is that the word for weeks here literally means sevens and is most certainly referring to years, not weeks. So Gabriel is saying to Daniel, seventy groups of seven years are determined for your people and for your holy city, or 490 years. He continues, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. So Gabriel tells Daniel that these 490 years would commence on the day that the decree is made to restore and build Jerusalem. Nehemiah 2.1 records the exact date of this decree, in the month of Nisan in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, or March 14th, 445 BC. However, just as there was a certain time for this prophecy's commencement, there must also be a certain time for its completion. That time, according to Daniel 9.25, is the time of Messiah the Prince. Gabriel says that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. So from the day of the decree to Messiah the Prince will be sixty-nine weeks, or four hundred and eighty-three years, which translates to one hundred and seventy-three thousand eight hundred and eighty days. Incredibly, when we count one hundred and seventy-three thousand eight hundred and eighty days, from the decree to rebuild Jerusalem on March 14, 445 BC, it brings us to the date of April 6, 32 AD, the very day Jesus Christ made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It is no coincidence that this was the only day he allowed himself to be proclaimed as a king. He knew full well about Daniel's prophecy. However, after this, there is a sudden suspension of the prophecy. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself. This is without doubt referring to the execution of Jesus. Interestingly, this suspension has been in effect for more than 2,000 years in what some call unreckoned time. However, Gabriel goes on to explain when the final set of seven years will commence. Then the prince who is to come shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. The remaining seven years of this prophecy will commence when the Antichrist confirms a seven-year covenant with Israel and will conclude with the second coming of Christ to earth. Now, I know these 70 weeks or 77s can be a little bit confusing, and if I had more time, I would go into detail a little bit more. But I'd highly recommend that you study this more for yourself. Now, of course, the Bible needs to be our primary and ultimate source of information because it is God's Word. But there is a really great book on this subject and others as well called The Day Approaching, written by Jewish believer Amir Sarfati. It's very well written and he really explains well these 70 weeks of Daniel and exactly what they encompass. So if you want to check him out, his ministry is called Behold Israel. I really highly recommend him. Corey, what did you study today? Thanks, Ryan. Well, today I wanted to talk to you all about King Belshazzar, because this is, we learn in Daniel chapter five, we meet King Belshazzar. And of course, this is the famous account where we get the writing of the wall. And we even use it today as, as um, you know, just see a the saying, writing on the wall. oh, I can yeah. see the writing on the wall. I know how this is going <laughs> to turn out, right? That's, that's what that saying means now. Uh, but King Belshazzar, it's really just been the last 160, 170 years where uh, he has not been lost to history. Uh, there was a time, uh, 200 years ago where uh, uh, Belshazzar was only known from the scriptures here, even though uh, Babylonian history is pretty well attested to. Uh, there, as early as the third century AD, 
So after the time of Jesus, in the time period of the early church, a Phoenician uh, philosopher actually theorized that the book of Daniel was made up, that it was written in the second century uh, BC, a, a few hundred years after the events it supposedly described. And this was because, you know, the book of Daniel is an uncomfortable one. It claims to have predicted events that happened between the Old and the New Testaments of the Bible. So if you don't believe in predictive prophecy, you have to explain the book of Daniel. And so his theory was that this was, Daniel was just a book that was made up uh, for religious re reasons and, and uh, really to give the people of Israel a reason to keep going and to hold together. Uh, now, this theory is still held by some, but there's a lot lot of evidence now against this point. Uh, first of all, Belshazzar, you know, he there are no records uh, in the Greek histories that talk about this. From the 5th century and the 4th century, they talk about this event of the takeover of Babylon by Cyrus of Persia. And interestingly, they mention that it was during a time period of festival in Babylon. So we hear, you know, Daniel 5, they're, they're having a big feast. So that works. And it was taken peacefully. That works as well. Belshazzar loses his life, but you don't hear about a big battle that happens. And we know from the records that that's because Cyrus's army basically walked in to Babylon and just took it over. Uh, but uh, Belshazzar is not mentioned by name in the Greek records. He had been lost to time. Only his father, Nabonidus, uh, who was technically the last king of Babylon, is mentioned. Uh, so we kind of figured that he was just some sort of made up character. It was an accidental slip of the pen from the, the author of Daniel. But in 1854, the British Museum team that was digging in Ur actually they found unearthed a, a cylinder that mentioned uh, it was written by Nabonidus and Nabonidus in it mentions his crown prince son Belshazzar and since that time period several other documents mentioning Belshazzar have come to light and uh, you'll you remember from a close reading of Daniel chapter 5 that uh, when Daniel interprets the writing in the wall Belshazzar elevates him to third Yes. in the kingdom, mm -hmm. not second. Now, if Belshazzar was the king proper then of Babylon, should he should be second. Right. So why? Because Belshazzar says, you'll only be underneath me. And we learn from history that Nabonidus had a co-regency with his son. So we learn that Nabonidus uh, had some very strange religious views for his time. And he actually moved away from Babylon, which was a big no-no. And he left his son Belshazzar the kingship of Babylon. So they were both kings at the same time, which is really interesting. Okay, so we now know that Belshazzar isn't made up. So what about that whole Daniel was written in the second century thing? Well, thankfully, with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they date to the second century BC, uh, BC when supposedly Daniel was being written. And they have copies of the book of Daniel, not the original book of Daniel. So if the book of Daniel was already being copied at this time period, it's a pretty big stretch to say it was being written at the same time it was being copied and incorporated into religious libraries. Uh, also, it's interesting to note that when the fifth and fourth century Greek historians had lost and forgotten the name of Belshazzar, Daniel remembered it. Daniel was accurate. So if by a hundred years after the fact, they've already forgotten the name of Belshazzar, Daniel remembers it, that's good evidence that it's recording accurate history. I think it's important to remember that the Bible always had the truth in Daniel. and. Uh, that becomes important because you know the, you've got the enlightenment, all that mm -hmm. happening, and all of a sudden we're you know we're new people, but we didn't know everything. And when you see the Bible, you realize, wait a minute, the enlightenment was forgetting yeah. the Bible, not remembering it. So I find that fascinating. It's food for thought, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> well, uh, this morning or the the at the beginning of the program. I announced that uh, I was going to talk about the train. Right, because this is a focus on Friday. Yeah. Usually I focus on a question, but because this is our 30th anniversary of this program, started out Project 90, went to Life Lessons, then Quick Study, and now Bible Discovery, we are going to talk about some memories today. Well, I, I okay. I found a VHS tape. Do you remember VHS? <laughs> I do remember okay. VHS. Mm -hmm. You guys remember VHS? We do. We're definitely yes. VHS children. And it was we a 1991 tape. Uh -huh. And uh, it was of Life Lessons. Mm -hmm. Right. We taped it at the yep. Crossroads Center. Mm -hmm. And I saw something 
that I could not believe I saw this train. Mm -hmm. Because we used to shoot images at the end of the show with the credits right. of these different mm -hmm. aspects. Right. And <laughs> DJ, one of our guys, found the train. Mm -hmm. He wasn't looking for it, but he, he found it in a building, a church building uh, that we used to be the pastor of. And, the, and he brought it over and he said, do you want this? I said, oh, I want that. I want that train. So there may be. My dad's train. There may be some viewers that remember those days. Do you remember, and remember the train? remember the, the, the train being shown at the 49. end. 49. <laughs> that, that, this I gotta look. I gotta get this going. I gotta get this. This is the big. See, it's the big track. We need so. to dust it off. Uh, dust it off. You could and, use a dusting. And get it going. It could yeah. use a dusting. Oh my it has goodness! Been in this a box is, in the wall. But it listen, that's the that's the engine. Yep. He also found. Oh, look at that. <laughs> the caboose. Here's the caboose. Right there it is. And look, look it says that. Pennsylvania. It says Pennsylvania. When you, that is one of our favorite awesome. places to go. That's where our American office is, and yes. that's great. And we've got three other cars, uh, and then we've got, I found two of his cars. Nice. My dad's car. My dad collected car, little cars, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, they were good, and I found two of his cars, and they're great. I'm going to fix them up and restore them and put them in my office. So thank you, DJ, who's on that camera over there. <laughs> thank you for finding that. I really appreciate it. And uh, there's the train, and maybe what I'll do is I'll get it going, and we'll take some video of it going. Mm. And, but that, that was amazing. That train's been around for 30 years. <laughs> Can you believe mm -hmm. that? Anyway, I'm just saying. It was exciting. Anyway. It's nice to have memories, isn't it? It is. And, and you uh, said that you remember as a little girl, you would have only you remember that train? probably I do. three. I spent many hours watching it, playing with it, memory pretending lane? to be in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. times. <laughs> and now your children yeah. can do the same thing. <laughs> memories. <laughs>